thing should be going now. Um, so I was up to here talking about these classes. All right. So anyway, um, this is the class that is intended to be the amount of security that everybody needs to know, even if you're primarily in you know, graphic design or uh, web design or, or whatever you're into. Uh, that's the point of this class is what the industry has generally accepted is the amount of security everybody should know, and therefore it's only defense. Um, and it's therefore kind of dull. But it's the first class because you learn all the languages. What's more fun, of course, is to practice combat. And uh, we have a lot of classes about that. DNS security is particular for the domain name system, which is a common target and also a common weapon used to attack other machines. But the most popular one of all is the hacking courses, of course. Um, and these were pretty new when we started them, although we've been doing it here for about six years. Um, and this is where you practice attacking systems, breaking into them, and protecting systems. And um, it's, it's working along quite well. The, now it got it the way it should have been, where the first class you're using tools, and the second class you're writing new tools. Um, took us a while to get up there. Now we are not having head-to-head -head direct competition in class. Uh, I haven't reached that point yet. I've tried it, and uh, the problem is uh, there's a small number of advanced students that just squash the others like bugs, and that's what tends to happen. I must say that is endemic to the field, because the competitions are all uh, varying degrees of imitation of the DEF CON capture the flag, and the DEF CON capture the flag is Bambi meets Godzilla. Um, there was uh, one group that won for seven years in a row and wrote a book about how to win, and nobody had a chance in the world against them. And that's more or less the real, real world is, too. Anyway, but it doesn't exactly make a fair game. Um, and they finally split them up, but I think they changed it in the last few years. But um, anyway, there's a lot of aspects. Computer forensics is getting evidence off machines if people have been committing crimes on them, and recovering lost data, and recovering data left by accident on devices. Everything you wear is recording everything you do. And um, it is not simple at all to stop it. Your GPS is recording everywhere you go. So is your cell phone. and. Uh, all that data is just sitting there. If you want to clean it off, it's not easy, unless you have an iPhone. iPhones have a reset to factory default that works. Everyone else has a fake button to lie to you and make you think you've cleaned it up, including the Mac, when you haven't. But iPhones are actually encrypted from the start. And, and reset to factory default deletes the key, and that really works. Um, and uh, Anyway, there's a whole lot of uh, supplemental activities out there. There's a whole security community, as you know. There's meetups for everything, and there's a ton of meetups and cons for security. And I'm amazed how explosive the security community is. Three years ago, my students could not walk into security jobs. You had to start as something like a network administrator and earn their trust first. But starting two years ago, my students are getting internships immediately at security companies because the bad guys are winning, and it's getting worse and worse. Everybody's getting hacked right and left. And they're getting more and more desperate. Um, so it's very easy to get the jobs. There's this thing called a certified ethical hacker, which is pretty lame, actually, because it doesn't have enough Linux in it. But it is respected by the US military. Uh, not by too many employers, but by the military. They're, they're proud. They like it. Um, and then this is the one everyone really respects, the CISSP. This makes you qualified to be a manager of security. And it comes with an ethical code, and you lose it if you're caught doing bad things, supposedly, although in practice that doesn't seem to actually work. Um, but anyway, this is the one that shows that you can interact with management productively, which is an enormous problem in this field. Why I'm always trying to get more people involved. Um, there's an old school of hackers that are basically like the gunslingers in the Old West, going around hacking everybody and proud of their skills, and uh, typically on drunks with the maturity of about six year old. Um, constantly having in feuds and wars with each other, hacking everybody in sight. And companies hire them for their technical skills, and then you can't trust them because they're crazy. And they're disgruntled, and they're always mad at the boss, and every now and then they hack the company and dump out all the data and betray their own bosses. So they would really rather replace them with actual trained professionals that learned this stuff in college and did not have a criminal past, but actually would otherwise like to hold their job and cooperate with the boss and get work done instead of prove that they're the mightiest by hacking somebody. So uh, this is part of the moving towards becoming a respected profession, like lawyers and doctors, where you actually have to go get a license and maintain your license to maintain some level of ethical conduct instead of the current shooting match, which is what the security team community tends to be. Um, and our most advanced courses require you to know some, some machine code and some assembler, because that's, of course, where the real power is. Um, malware analysis is figuring out 
how to take infectious things like viruses and take them apart and figure out how they work and figure out how to stop them and detect them. And this really is a course in Windows internals. Windows is an unbelievable mess. I mean, Microsoft doesn't usually develop new things as much as they just absorb them like an amoeba. If you make something cool, Microsoft will buy your company, patch in your stuff, and it will add on to the growing Borg-like construct that is Windows. And so there turn out to be 25 different ways to do the same thing and all these backdoor ways to make it do something. There are 25 known ways of taking a program you launch and causing it to actually run additional code while it's running because all these patch techniques have come in for version control and adding another driver and everything else. So it's very easy to take a program and tell it, oh, by the way, I'd run this extra code too. <laughs> and that's what most malware does. So anyway, um, this is only impossible in the last couple of years because of uh, new developments in malware analysis tools that make it possible. When I first heard of this, uh, I thought the only way to do this was to wade through 20,000 lines of assembler. And that's painful and horrible, and that's not how you do it. There are new tools that make it much easier than that. Um, and Mandiant is the main company that, that figured this out and they published this book before they were brought out by FireEye and they're the people following the Chinese advanced persistent threats. There's two people following the government sponsored hacking. There's, there's two main groups. Mandiant is the American group that primarily focuses on what the Chinese are doing and Kaspersky in Russia focuses primarily on what the NSA is doing. They call them the equation group. And both of them have very accurately mapped the layers of attacks. We are the number one cyber aggressor in the world. We have the most dangerous military, and we hack everybody right and left, and don't be screaming about them hacking us back. China says, we aren't doing anything compared to what you're doing for us, and I think that is true. However, they're doing plenty, and the Russians are doing plenty, um, and everybody is analyzing the other guy's attacks, and they're getting pretty scary. The NSA's attacks in the last three or four years will now infect um, other chips on the main board. They'll affect the BIOS and, uh, and uh, they can buy and there are rootkits that can hide in your network card, and so on. So even reformatting the hard drive or replacing the hard drive does not get rid of it. And the NSA has also made it quite clear that they will, uh, when you ship routers and computers to you, they will intercept the UPS, open the box, add hardware components to spy on you, and then deliver it to you. So you get it pre-Trojans and owned. So, you know, if you're an American citizen, supposedly the NSA can't do that to you. But if you're European, they totally can, and that's why Miko Hyponen is so mad all the time at F-Secure, because he says Europeans should never use American services. As a matter of fact, it probably violates Euro European privacy law for Europeans to use American companies like Google and Yahoo, because everything they have, they have to hand it right over to the government, because there are no privacy rights for foreigners. But uh, currently, there is no European offering to compare with them at the price, so everyone does it anyway. Anyway, and, and this is a new class, first time this semester, which is fun, um, developing new attacks. Although, right now we're developing simple attacks, but it will get tougher as we go through. Um, and I thought I'd show you one of these because it's kind of fun. I was pleased to get this going. So I've got a server here. Um, this is a server that is a web server, as you can see, attack32.samsclass.info. But it is not only a web server, it's also serving up another process that you can hack into. So if you connect to attack... on port 4030, it tells you you are connected to the server. And all this server does is if you put in a, a string, it echoes it back to you. It also prints the extended stack pointer to make it a little bit easier for the attackers. Now this is the classic attack, the LF0 type buffer overflow. The point of this server is it takes input from the network card, it puts it in a variable, it then calls a subroutine and copies it into another variable without checking the length, and then comes back. So if you put in enough data, it will crash. And the whole point of the exploit development class is learning how to do this properly. And in this case, um, I think I put it here. Yeah, so these are various strings. If I just cat this string, so here's one that will crash it, just a whole lot of A's and then some numbers. Um, if you give it about 700 characters, it will crash because it overflows the buffer. But if you very carefully choose what you feed in, you put in some A's and then some moderately unprintable binary stuff. It's just another string. And if you look at the length of these things, for this particular server, all you need is 517 bytes to take it over. And the construction of this stuff is, if you look at what I printed out there, um, this is just A's to fill it. Then it is NOPs to make a NOPs sled. These are machine languages. This character has no effect. It is just a 
uh, do nothing, do nothing, do nothing, the steps through machine language. Then there is the egg here, and the egg is a attack that will open a listening port and give me remote control of the machine. And then at the end of that is another buffer I filled with ease, and at the very end are four bytes, and those bytes point back into the NOP sled. So the point is this in the subroutine overflows the buffer. The, this overwrites the stored extended instruction pointer, so when it returns from that routine, instead of returning back to the calling program, it jumps into here and executes the egg and gives me control of the machine. So I run it. Remember, I can hack this way. Um, attack. Got to spell it right, though. And 4030. And then I feed in that last attack of E5. And that will not give me a sensible response because it will flood the server, but it should now be open now. So if I um, connect this way on 4444, should have got an answer. Didn't get it here, and I'm not going to struggle with it here. Um, there's always various problems. Let me try one more thing, though, because I just might be killing it. I started three of these. Let's try this one. And that looks a little better. And then this one. Yeah, so now if I do who am I, yeah, okay, I'm now in control of this Linux server. I've, my buffer overflow is open to listening port, and I now give it commands, like here's, I can do ls minus a, and see everything in this location, and um, if I wish to be added, what I've done, see I started this server about four days ago, and I invited the whole world to hack into it. So far, none of my students have gotten in, which disappointed me, but two random hackers in the world on Twitter got in. And what I'm surprised at is they didn't gain complete control of my server and replace this with an offensive image, which is a typical thing people do. All they were able to do is what I planned for them to do. See, I've, I only gave them non-root privileges on this server if you hack in. But I thought somebody might be brilliant enough to just take over the whole thing. But what you can do is you can get yourself on that list because there's a cron job running every one minute. And it checks to see if you have hacked in and created these two files. So if I go here, if I do um, echo... Sam demo into a file called winners and then I put in touch a file called um, update now then it will detect that within one minute and delete those two files and put the contents of winners on that list that's what my cron jobs are doing and that's all people have done so far so within a minute It'll pop up another line there. And the, so the point is, I own it, but this is the first step. I found a vulnerability and taken over, but now I'm only controlling that machine with the privileges of the server. The next step is privilege escalation, to escalate myself up to root and take over the whole machine and install fresh malware on this machine and use it as a launch to take over the next machine at the company, and that's pivoting. And that's how you do it. And this is why every machine is, every company is vulnerable and every pen tester has a success rate of 100%. If they don't have 100% success rate at getting domain administrator at your company, then fire them because they are incompetent. There is always a way in because somewhere in your vast company, there is some idiot that brought in an old laptop that doesn't have its patches or forgot to update their antivirus or installed some stupid game or something or AOL Instant Messenger. Somebody forgot somewhere. Or there's somebody dumb enough to click on an email attachment or a link you sent them. You can get somebody to do the bad thing, and then you have one machine in the network. Then you escalate to administrator on that machine, and you start pivoting around, and it's really only four or five hops at the most before you're in the domain administrator. And, you know, that's, that's why pen tests are required to take payment cards. There we are. So it worked. I can get that far. Um, I'm not aware of an exploit that will escalate you to administrator on this thing right now. This is Ubuntu Linux 1504. So it's, uh, what is this, September? It's about five months old. I don't think there's any known privilege escalation exploits on it, but, you know, I'm sure there's plenty out there. There probably isn't anybody too motivated to burn it on my silly demo, though. Anyway, because um, you can only use these things so many times. This one here was a lot of fun. I taught this class here for the first time last semester, hacking mobile devices, and this turned into quite a circus because I started looking at Android security. And Android security is ridiculous. It's the way Windows security was in the early 90s. Um, if I decided to try large companies that really ought to be secure, and um, I think I'll just go over this one. Yeah. Uh, so here's so I went to uh, 
this one was probably the most, yeah, code modifications. He, I should mention this. This is actually quite useful for you folks. OWASP is a group you really should know about. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Platform. It is a volunteer organization. It has people from almost every company you've ever heard of that cheerfully donate their time to it. And they analyze the security of web applications primarily, um, servers like Gmail and such, because they're the most important ones. And they get hacked all the time. And they rate, among many other things, they have a top 10 list, which are the top 10 vulnerabilities. And they have details of how to prevent these vulnerabilities in all the popular languages. And they have one for mobile devices. So I started looking here for various problems, and the ones that are easiest to detect are insecure data storage on the device, so that if someone steals your phone, they get your secrets. Insufficient security and transport, like a lot of mobile applications send plain text passwords over the internet, or if they use HTTPS connections, they implement them improperly so you can still intercept them and steal the data. And another particular one that I find by far the most common is M10, lack of binary protections. If you write a program in C++ and you compile it and you sell it like Microsoft Office, what the user gets is an object file, executable code, and it's very hard to get from that back to source code. But it is very easy to get from Android applications back to source code. Every time you get an Android app, it's, a, um, it's an APK file that includes the smally byte code and that stuff is very readable it's almost as readable as java and in there you will find their algorithms their passwords everything and you can also modify it and make a modified file with a trojan in it so i tested to see how many of the big companies have this problem and the answer is 70 percent of them and i just went through the top 10 banks and the top 10 insurance companies and the top 10 stock companies and all the ones you see here are vulnerable um, so you can add a trojan to them and steal the password a few of them fixed it. What's funny is these guys can't talk to me. I thought the Bank of America was ignoring me. I told them in February they didn't do anything and they didn't patch it. But when I went to the security conferences over the summer, these guys came to talk to me secretly. A guy caught me waiting in line and said, I'm from the Bank of America. You shouldn't keep calling us out. We're fine. We're not going to fix it. This problem doesn't matter. But um, then Citibank said thanks and they're going to fix it. Wells Fargo said thanks and they really did fix it. You can add protection to your code so the source code is not just hanging out. You just, there are layers, there are ways to obfuscate it, and there are layers of defenses to detect if someone is altering your code. There are products you can buy for just a few thousand bucks that will do it, and these guys have got the money, but they just don't care. Um, and there's a lot of other problems. A lot of these guys send uh, data insecurely when you log in, uh, leave your data on the phone. And the funniest one, I put one here with a special color to show TD Ameritrade gets the special Ig Nobel Prize. So I sent TD Ameritrade this notification in February. And what I said was, what I did was I took a phone and ran their app, and I took the, you can just pull the um, APK file right off the phone here. The APK file is like a zip file that includes the entire Android app, and you can unpack it, and you will see the source code, and the source code just looks like this. Username, password, just sitting right there. So it's pretty easy to steal. You can just grep for password and find the password. So this is the Trojan. I put in six lines, four lines of, of Smalley. This puts the username in the log, and this puts the password in the log. Now, the log is the syslog. You should never put anything secret in there. It's available to every app on the phone. So I put that in there, and after I Trojan it and recompile it and re-sign it, then I can run it, and then the user ID and password just appear in the log. So I sent this to them and said, you should have binary protection on your code, so I can't do this. And what they did was they modified their product, the next version came out, and when I tested it, there were now two copies of the username and the password in the log. They changed their product so it logged the username and password, which I thought is bloody awesome. And so what happened is when I taught the class here, the students worked mostly with a fake banking app written to make every possible mistake. But by the time we finished that class, and I went to teach it in Texas and in Las Vegas, all over the place, I used real apps. All my homework is now real apps. You download from the real store and see all this stupid stuff they're doing. And they're all people I have told who don't care and won't fix it. One of the funniest ones was Mayo Clinic, because they were actually a funder of the B-Sides Las Vegas conference. They had their posters everywhere, and their app has a password. They have an EMT app that the medical technicians in the ambulance are using to look up stuff, and they don't want the whole world seeing it, so there's a password on it. And it says right when you download it from a store, you can't get the password from the developer. You can only get the password by Mayo Clinic by being registered EMT, but you can look in the source code, and it's just right there. 
And so I told the developer, and, then I, and one thing I've noticed is when you have a developer do something that bad, you look at their other products. And he has a whole product line of similar apps with the same mistakes. So I sent like four or five notices, and then he finally responded and said, stop sending me this, bam, what's wrong with you anyway? I said, that's the magic word, that's voluntary to be homework. You know, I've now completed my ethical requirement of giving you a chance to fix it, and you have been kind enough to say, I don't care. I say, fine, if you don't care, your homework. So all my students are finding the magic password and seeing the secret stuff. And, you know, there's... But uh, what's going on is all these things are pretty much all coded in Pakistan. All the American companies are just fronts that outsource it. And there are five or six big coding farms in Pakistan writing most of this, and some of them do good work, and some of them do terrible work. Um, but I was impressed by uh, the one that makes college apps. I found a company called Straxis that makes 100 college apps, and they're very pretty. But instead of, but they have a frame they put around it, like the name of your company, West Point uses them, the U.S. Air Force Academy, uh, the Naval Academy uses them, and hundreds of other big colleges. They had a very pretty app, and when you open pages, they open inside here. They wrote their own browser, and they wrote it insecurely, so everything you put in that browser leaks out. So not only do you lose your password for West Point, you lose your Google password, Facebook password, Twitter password, and everything else, and your credit card numbers when you try to donate college money to the school. So I notified the first five or ten of these, and then I just contacted the developer because I could tell their entire product line of over 100 apps was vulnerable, and they were quite sensible. They talked to me. They said, well, fix it. They waited the next product release. They somehow were organized enough so they could just update their libraries, and it was all fixed the whole line. So I've now got, I think, six lines of products like that that I know of. But when I taught this class in Texas, the administrators got so scared that they threatened to fire me and blacklist me. And then all my students said if they threw me out, they wouldn't come back. And so they decided not to do that, but it scared my students, who were all college teachers, into realizing if you find a problem and tell people about it, your management really can't fire you for doing that. Um, because people, you until you get in this business, it's hard to believe how stupid administrators are. But the first reaction of administrators when you tell them about a security problem is to shoot the messenger and the problem is solved. I mean, this happened to the Catholic Church. It happens to a lot of people. It is just the simplest answer for people in authority to just step on the person talk complaining and call the problem solved. And uh, anyway, so now they've bumped it back to me and I've got a big backlog of people to notify. Half of my students didn't want to get credit for their discoveries because after three days of training, they were able to start researching their own apps, and they found a ton of problems. In um, Android apps are just a placebo. People think they, if they get an Android phone, they're getting the same thing as if they get an iPhone, and that is extremely false. iPhones are much older, and they made all these mistakes six years ago. The modern version of the iPhone has a lot of defenses and is a whole lot safer to use than Android. Android is like playing in traffic. iPhone is like playing in your backyard with your parents watching over you because you can only install apps from the Apple Store, and Apple actually cleans up the store. Though Android is Linux, it's freedom, it's hippie to hell. You can put on apps anywhere. You can write your own apps, and therefore, all the criminals in the world can write poison apps and put them everywhere, and that's what you're running. Anyway, so that's, I think that's all I want to tell you. If you don't have any questions, yeah? Oh, no, I will teach it. No, I, they banned me in Texas, then they unbanned me. I used to use that to promote my Vegas course. This is the course that got banned in Texas. So, um, you know, that's, people get, I've learned, the more people get mad at you, the more it proves you're doing your job here. Um, if there isn't somebody calling the college screaming bloody murder that you have to fire me immediately, then I'm not doing my job. One of these um, medical companies here did, in fact, call the college and demand that they fire me and take down my website. Um, and they, they called the chancellor and said they were going to sue the college to take me take down my website that exposed the vulnerability in their medical app. And I sent him, he said, let me take care of it. I sent him an email. I said, I'm not going to talk to you on the phone. Send me a written letter. I will show it to my lawyer and draft a response. You're wasting your time talking to the college because the college didn't put up the page. I put up that page. And if you want it taken down, you've got to talk to me. And suddenly, they were polite. And they said, well, we feel like your statement isn't entirely correct and you should amend it. And I said, well, now we're talking. So there's no more talk of suing me and everything. But, yeah. Well, you don't really need any of it. I mean, for it would certainly help if you know something about assembler, but you certainly don't need a whole assembler course. It makes you stronger, though. Knowing something about C and compiling helps for the more advanced ones. Um, and for the Android one, it might help a little bit to know some Java. But see, that's why hacking is fun. You don't need to actually know how to do anything productive. You just know how to find mistakes in it. It's sort of like the difference between doing something and criticizing it. You know, it's much easier to criticize. You don't need to know much at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are the 
oh, they're just scattered all over the place. There's really no order. That's a very important issue because when I went to college, there's math that was organized, Calc 1, Calc 2, and Calc 3. Here, there's like a couple of central things you want to know, like 106 basic networking and 102 basic security. And once you know them, you can just do anything because it's not true that you need this to go there. It's more like you just go into a field and you're just surrounded by stuff to do. And the amazing thing to me is if you get in security, you only have to study for like one or two years before you are on the front lines. I thought I was just going to be a peaceful teacher teaching like math, but I'm in direct combat with criminals. And I didn't see that coming. I mean, but the front lines are only like one year of study away from a beginner. Yeah. Oh, yes. They've hacked the college six times, I think, to shut me up. There's, there's all, I'm not lying. There's, I think six or seven people have contacted the administration here telling them they must fire me immediately and get rid of me. Um, they dumped teachers' PayPal accounts to try to get me down. They hacked Hills and froze it up for about 24 hours. Um, they, if you do this stuff right, people hate your guts. Yeah, but they don't often try to notify companies like I do. That's how you get in trouble. Um, now, my students get, dorm, get normal jobs. And um, so, I mean, you don't get in the thick of this unless you make yourself a public figure by talking at conventions and by associating with criminals, which I certainly do. You can certainly have a normal job and know this stuff and, not, and stay a little bit back from the fray. But I chose to be a public figure because the fact is almost no college teachers dare teach this stuff. They think they'll get fired. And I thought, what will happen if I just do it all publicly? Will I get fired? And that didn't happen. But on the other hand, there is quite a lot of trouble. You, if, you, if anybody can see you in the world of hacking, somebody will dump a load of junk on you. That's just the way it is. Because a lot of them are just immature and they have too much testosterone and they just want to punch somebody and brag. It's very much like the Wild West. They want to shoot the guy. So you, you have to have a thick skin. You get a lot of insults. But that's pretty much true online. I mean, look at Gamergate and stuff. If you, wanna, if you have any public presence, somebody will dump a load of crap on you. <laughs> and you just have to sort of cope with that. Yes, and some of the leaders are women. Joanna Rychkowska. Joanna Rychkowska runs, runs uh, little things in, yeah, she makes cubes, and she makes the root kits that make cubes necessary. She makes the most dangerous root kits in the world from Poland. Small Things Incorporated. She can see someone that can put a root kit in your network card where you can't see it and you can't clean it out. Um, and she has the defense against it, which is a operating system she wrote that has like five virtual machines and you use different color codes for all of your networking. So you do your banking in this one and your social networking in that one and they can't see each other. So the root kids can't steal your stuff. Um, and there's a whole lot of women in it on the side of the legal management compliance and administration side. Because that side is actually more normal and you get to go home at five and you aren't involved in this dirty fighting. Uh, the dirty fighting scares away, I think, the women somewhat more than the men. But there's plenty of women in it, too. Um, now, there's a lot of women in this field, but there's a lot of macho posturing among the men. And that makes them fail and leave a clear path for people who can keep a level head. Yep? I gotta ask a silly question. How accurate is the TV show Mr. Robot? I don't know. I've never seen it. I gave up watching TV a long time ago. Now I'm watching stuff 15 years old on Netflix. I can't believe I ever tolerated commercials. They just make me sick. Commercials in the news are just pure poison. I'm so glad I got them out of my life. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, well, sort of, yes. Um, back, see, this my my real uh, notoriety came out in 2011 when a lulsec was out there, an anonymous. I took strong stand against them because almost nobody would dare to, because if you would speak out against them, then your company would get hacked and you'd get fired. And I'm here relatively invulnerable, so I'm the one that can afford to say they shouldn't be doing this stuff. And um, I also had the curious habit of actually reading the stuff they dumped. And they dumped, one of the big dumps from LulzSec was about 100 pages long, and it was stuff they stole from China. And it included six open sequel injections on Chinese government servers. And the week I found that, Obama made this statement. I wasn't as alert as I am now to the fact that Obama just says an enormous number of stupid things that drop hit to the ground and he cancels them the next day. But he said that if the Chinese attacked us with a cyber weapon, we would respond with kinetic warfare. And at that time, there were certainly a lot of people in Anonymous and LulzSec that I thought would take over those Chinese servers and use them to launch an attack on the West to cause that to happen for laughs. 
And so I wanted to see those vulnerabilities fixed. And I put out on Twitter, I want some contacts uh, in the US government or the inside the Chinese government, for that matter, to warn them about this. And I was put covertly in contact with a member of the State Department who actually got it to the Chinese government. They actually fixed it. I later learned that there's a lot of problems like that. But anyway, it's um. so you know, you get, uh, that was when it was really crazy. Then the FBI squashed those guys like bugs. By the end of 2011, they're all locked up. One in three of all criminal hackers is an FBI informant. So if you're doing anything and you're not doing it alone, you go straight to prison. So you don't, haven't heard a peep out of them, really, in years in America. They've pretty much been wiped out by the FBI. So it got a lot more sane than it was in 2011 and early 2012 when they were dumping out police databases and everything else. So now it's relatively normal. Now you just deal with usual bureaucratic garbage. It's not as many criminal hackers hacking everybody. Any other questions? Yeah? No, not particularly. I mean, I think the mobile device hacking class is as far as I want to go in that direction yet. The Internet of Things is certainly hackable, and Charlie Miller certainly hit the uh, headlines by hacking the cars, what he'd been doing for the last two years. I mean, he totally can turn off the brakes while you're driving. And that, and that exposed something which um, Sid Dragon showed a few months earlier about airplanes, which is on both airplanes and cars, they did not isolate the entertainment system from the navigation system. And in retrospect, of course, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> But the fact is those two things are connected, and that's a bad idea. Duh. This is why God invented the air gap. Anyway, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the air gap is a whole lot better than what we got. Anyway, um, all right. Well, I think I better go. i got to teach a class. I hope some of that helps you some. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to turn this thing off. Uh, file. How do you stop it? Up here I stop it. Okay.